about prayer in the context of Abedah. And last time we talked about uh, we talked about the primary assumption of prayer from a Jewish perspective, the purpose of prayer, um, the character of prayer. Um, we we only talked a little bit about. I don't think we got to the heart attitude. So I was going to pick it up from there, but I don't, I don't want to spend too much time over the kind of the duh uh, stuff. We talked about how there's a lot of things in Christianity uh, that we would probably be most familiar with that were borrowed from Judaism. And so that's, you know, like it's one of those duh uh, things, right? But last week, we were ta- last time anyway, we were talking about how the context of what Hashem was doing with Israel how, how unique it was compared to the pagan cultures that were around it. So, for example, in the pagan cultures around, you feared God. You didn't approach God. You didn't talk to God. You certainly didn't stand in the presence of God. You know, you trembled before God. And God, you know, the gods might take interest in you or might not. But there was no personal relationship. There was no sense of being heard necessarily. There was, it was totally different. So when Judaism comes along and what we see in, in Moses being able to talk to God and Abraham being able to talk to God and having that personal relationship and being able to negotiate and have this dialogue with God, to us we take it for granted because we've been brought up in it within Christianity. But at that time, that, that was incredible. It was amazing. It was life-changing. It was... A total different, in in science we call the paradigm shift. Okay, it's a totally different way of looking at our relationship with God. And so so prayer is to be understood in that context, that it's this deeply intimate personal relationship with God. And we get to have a conversation. Now today we're going to focus a little bit more on liturgy. And there's some really exciting things. I was telling Susie, I actually didn't go to bed till 4.15 this morning. Because, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm so busy during the week. And so, you know, by the time I clean up from Shabbat and then I start preparing my stuff. And then there was this thing I thought about looking at and this, the other. And then I found this other thing. And then before I know it, you know, Mitchell's like, he gets into a bathroom. He's like, it's 4.15. Don't you think you should? I'm just like, I think I'm almost done. <laughs> So I don't know if we'll get to everything today, because there's some exciting things that I was seeing, I learned for the first time that I wanted to pass on to you. Um, but here's also the other thing. Uh, as you heard with the, my prayer request, I, I have that and a lot of other things on my plate. And um, so what I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I need to take a break from teaching after May. Okay, so I'd like to finish off this portion on prayer. If I don't get to everything today, we'll still meet next month. And we can still keep meeting as women and praying and doing all sorts of things. But I, I need to take a little break from teaching in June, July, and August. And one of the challenges I'm going to give you is, because um, right at the beginning we talked about Avodah as a service, and is it, it, like, will it impact how we do things differently? And so I thought we'd do a little experiment especially after we talk about the things we're going to talk about this week and last week, that we spend three months in the summer doing something different with our prayer life than we've done before. And then that way we can come back in September and talk about what did we learn. Um, I don't know, just sort of an idea to put out there. That doesn't mean necessarily that we would stop meeting because we can still meet and pray together and whatever. It's just I'm feeling like I need to take a three-month break. And last year we ended up taking a break in the summer anyway because people were here and there and everywhere. And... um, so, but I wanted to make sure that we finished off this, this portion of prayer and then maybe had some things to experiment with. How's that sound? Does that, that sound? That sounds good. It's fine. Yeah. All right. So, we talked about last time about the character of prayer, and I had promised I would talk about Kavanaugh. And this is going to be really, really an important concept today is we talk, start talking about liturgical prayer. Um, uh, you guys have heard of the term Kavanah before? Okay, Kavanah. Okay, so Kavanah in, in Judaism is the, the idea of our heartfelt attitude as we're praying and that we should pray with understanding. With understanding, with involvement, with focus, with concentration. Okay, 
So, what is it called again? Kavanaugh. So, on, on uh, uh, the newer outline or the old outline, we're on page like three. It's under, um, it would be under the title of Character of Prayer. So, if you find Character of Prayer, it's on page two on the old one. Okay. Page three on the, new, on the newer revised edition, page two on the old one. We're going to talk, talk a little bit about Kavanaugh. This is really important because. As we're going to see in a minute, uh, a lot of more modern, more recent Christianity, especially evangelical Christianity, especially charismatic evangelical Christianity, um, has criticized liturgical forms of worship as being rote, okay, because there's the one thing that Jesus said that uh, Yeshua said that we're going to look at in a second about do not, you know, Pray with about vain repetition. Okay, so we're going to talk. That's why I want to get there today because it's, it's really kind of interesting to, to think about uh, what he might have meant by that. Um, because obviously here at BSVT, we've decided that 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 especially in the last year or so, two years or so, we've decided to incorporate Jewish liturgy into our worship. Okay, and I wasn't party of all the reasons why we decided to do that, but I think it's important to know why we do what we do, you know, and how does that kind of fit into um, our avodah. And uh, so Judaism and other liturgical forms of worship, including the Catholic Church, and last time we talked about the Anglican or Episcopalian Church being uh, Catholic light, <laughs> and uh, other liturgical forms of worship have been criticized as well you're not doing what Yeshua said because Yeshua said you know don't do as pagans do with vain repetitions blah 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 the question is is that what we're doing when we're doing liturgy and, and one of the responses to that question I believe is that within Judaism there has always been an understanding that you don't just do vain repetition and I think there's another interpretation of what he was saying there also but but to answer the criticism of, well, liturgical prayer, you just say the same things every Saturday, so it doesn't mean anything. That within Judaism, there's this very, very strong emphasis about um, kavanah, the intention with which you pray. And there's all sorts of teaching and writing and about kavanah. Okay, in fact, and I just put this just as a, a little little summary, there's... there's thought to be at least three levels of kavanah. The first is, is just the simple understanding of the words being recited. Now we'll look in a, in a minute, a little bit later, uh, also at the, the language of prayer and, okay, so we do the liturgy in Hebrew. So can you have kavanah if you're doing it in Hebrew and you don't know what you're saying? No. Okay. Which is why we don't do it just in Hebrew. We do it in Hebrew and English. And, and what's interesting is, is that when I go and visit the, the Orthodox con congregation at Chabad, on the festivals, when there's lots of people there that aren't there usually, okay, because you know there's, there's um, Christmas Easter Christians and there's also uh, Passover Yom Kippur Jews, right? You know, you just you go to synagogue because it's the festival. Right. You have no idea what's going on, blah, 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 blah. But what's really interesting is because I'm there on an ordinary Shabbat and then I'm there on a special festival when it's like packed out, it's really interesting because they do more of the English translation in some of the responsive reading in the liturgy. Because of why? Because of Kavanah. Because they want to make sure, especially like at Rosh Hashanah, when you're saying the vidoy, the confession, it's said in English as well as Hebrew because there needs to be understanding in Kavanah. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. So, the second, identification. The second level is where you're not just saying it and understanding what the words mean, but this is you praying. You're understanding. <clears throat> you're beyond, beyond understanding, you're identifying with the words. This mm -hmm. is your prayer. You are identifying with Israel at the, at the banks of the Red Sea singing uh, Shor Hadash, the, the, the new song, right? Uh, after we've crossed the Red Sea. You are there in the story. And this is your prayer. Uh, I, for me, I grew up in an Anglican church, and I told this story last time, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to repeat it, but, but just I, I grew up in an Anglican church that was very liturgical. When I came into relationship with the Lord when I was 18, all of a sudden the li liturgy wasn't vain repetition anymore. Because why? I had Kavanaugh. It meant something to me. It wasn't just that I understood the words. It's now, this is the story of my life. I'm identifying 
with what I'm praying. And it totally changed the liturgy for me. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, even within Messianic Judaism, well, we were in a congregation for three years and we had did liturgy every Saturday and blah, 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 blah. And there was other things going on there. And anyway, we ended up in this kind of small kind of house fellowship. And suddenly, it was interesting because suddenly in that time of distress for me, in that smaller setting, in a small room, in somebody's living room, and we're praying this together, and it's a small, it felt different. It was a different kavanah for me. And that liturgy, all of a sudden, some of those words of the Amidah became my prayer with tears. Okay. So that's where I'm coming from with liturgy. From all the way from boredom, uh, what the heck is this, to... This is speaking to me in my situation right now. And it is giving me the words to say that I can't find for myself. If I had time today, I would, I would have prayed for you. It's a really kind of cute little uh, blurb uh, by Jeremy uh, Gimmel, Gimple uh, from Israel, who has a, a series of videos on the land of Israel that, that tries to educate the rest of the world about Israel and Judaism and so forth. And he has this great thing about liturgy. And um, what he talks about is it's kind of like a love song to the person you love when you're like really lousy with words. You, you know how it's great when you find a Hallmark card that just says <laughs> yeah, exactly. what you want to say, right? right? right. And, and so he, it's, it's really kind of a cute little video clip, but he, he talks about it being like you want to send a love letter, but you don't know what words to say, and the liturgy helps us say it. Absolutely. Okay, so that's that element of kavanah um, yeah. when it comes to liturgy. And then the third level is the mystical or esoteric level, which you can find in the Kabbalah, where it even gets to the point where as you're praying the liturgy, you're at such this level of spiritual experience that you and the words are one, and the things that you are saying you are bringing into reality through the power of the prayer, and it's like pretty cool, and I don't understand any of it. <laughs> but if you want to read the Kabbalah or our book on Kabbalah and prayer, please share it with us. <laughs> but it's you know that's it's that more mystical esoteric level of kavanah where where you're just you know and I can see it sometimes happen with well if, I, I'm sure Mitchell wouldn't mind me sharing this but there was one point early on when he began um, attending Chabad and he was really working on his Hebrew and praying in Hebrew. We'll talk about why it's considered the holy language and important to pray in Hebrew, whatever. So he wasn't even necessarily understanding at that point what every word meant. Now that he's prayed so much in Hebrew, he, he has a pretty good understanding of the vocabulary. And he came home one day and he said, I had this most amazing experience when we were praying the liturgy. Um, he didn't put it in those terms, but he said, when we're praying. He said, I felt like I was standing in the presence of God like Moses was standing at the burning bush and I had to back up and hide next to the bookshelf because I felt like he was passing in front of me and his and I just couldn't almost bear to be in his presence. That's that esoteric mystical level of kavanah. That make sense? Mm -hmm. wish, I, wish I'd had that, but I haven't had that yet. But he, that's why Chabad is so... Um, uh, helpful to his, his, his spiritual development. Anyway, so so that's kavanah, and as we go on to talk about liturgy, you'll you'll see how um, the structure of the liturgy and the kavanah. There's sort of like this, like an interplay between what's going on inside of us versus what we're doing with everybody else. Okay. So, uh, heart attitude. Obviously, we want to come with a heart attitude, and, and uh, Judaism teaches us, Christianity would, that we come with patient obedience, a desire to please him. Uh, Don, you had mentioned last week, you were asking about uh, the need for forgiveness, the need for us to confess our sin. That's part of the heart attitude that we bring. But what we will see is that it's written actually into the liturgy how it brings us to that place of confessing sin and asking for forgiveness, that that is part of, if you do the whole liturgy, you get to that point. Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, perspective of unselfishness, the community perspective within Judaism is really important, as we're going to see, that we do not pray just for ourselves. In fact, most of our prayers, especially on Shabbat, are for others. We are praying on behalf of the community, on behalf of the nation, on behalf of others. 
And that's a very, very important emphasis in Judaism that you don't see so much in Christianity. Because in Christianity was very influenced by more of the kind of the Greek influence of uh, idea of spirituality, which is in an individual perspective. It's not a community perspective. Okay. Um, and then, of course, humility, submitting the will of Hashem, not, not our, our will, but his. Um, Yeshua, I, 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 Yeshua wasn't the first one to say it. He was the first one to, to, get, to say it to the point of death. But it's definitely a teaching within Judaism, um, not our will, but his. And last time, uh, we talked about how prayer is a process, very much what Sid was saying, talking about today. It's not a product, it's a process. And so it transforms us, and that very much the, the purpose of prayer is to bring us to the place where we are now desiring the will of the Father and not, not our will, because through the process of prayer. Um, so, and I'll refer you to last session's um, tape. So, um, last time we talked... Uh, about the elements of prayer, that there is a formula within Judaism that you also see in the in the in the Brit Haharashah, that there is this uh, element of reverence, loving praise, supplication, gratitude, and thanksgiving. Now, for those of you who are familiar with the liturgy that we pray every Saturday, can you think of a place where we follow that formula? Skill testing question. Don't turn over the page. When you say the Esmonius Reedy, I mean, uh, exactly. but I know it, not everybody does that. But um, to me, that it really is like Rabbi was saying today. You say something once, but then when you say it again. Mm -hmm. And it was like the first time I was, oh my, this is, you know, kind of like they say repetition. Mm -hmm. Then I said it, the, you know, for noon. Mm -hmm. And you say it in the evening, and you just really heart felt before Hashem. Right. It's really, it's really awesome. It really is. I really encourage everybody to do it. Well, the Baptist um, said that you have to, you really need to sing a song 21 times before it gets in your heart. Mm -hmm. So they'll do it in the service. Oh, sing the really? same chorus 21 times. Oh, at least. At least in some of the United, it's a, I, the black churches. Anyway, you'll do it forever. And, wow. But it's kind of cool because mm -hmm. that exactly that same uh -huh. phenomenon. But you're right, the Shemona Esrei has those elements, if you see all of it, right, if you pray all of it, it has those elements of reverence, and then gets into praise, and then gets into supplication requests, and then gratitude and thanksgiving. So if you turn over the page, um, I wanted to talk about the Amidah, um, because it is so central to the liturgy, and it has been around for so long, and it would have probably been prayed by Yeshua in some form, right? Um, that and, and the, the Kaddish are the two oldest parts of the liturgy. And they're also the most universal parts of the liturgy. So that you can go into an Orthodox, modern Orthodox, Reformed, Conservative, Revisionist, whatever synagogue, and pretty much Saturday morning, you're going to have Kaddish, you're going to have Amidah. The wording might be a little bit different, so forth. We'll see why, but but you're, you pretty much the wording is the same, and that's pretty amazing. That over two thousand years, that there's this 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 central prayer that's been preserved, and and has unified the Jewish nation, even though they've been scattered from you know Japan to Canada and back again. Does that make sense? And I think too. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Well, no, it's when you um, you were saying. Um, it gives you the words you want to say, mm -hmm. and it's, it's especially true with me for the part Vidui mm -hmm. confession Vidoy. of mm -hmm. I say Vidui Vidui mm -hmm. um, confession of sin. The words, I mean, it's like yeah. you know, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. Mm -hmm. You know, when you know that you have, and the words, it gives you the words, the depth of the words mm -hmm. in your spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to speak mm -hmm. before Him. So. Yeah. Well, and, and this is what we talked about, um, and I don't know if you were here, Nancy, the very first time we introduced the idea of Avodah, we were talking, we kind of looked at um, uh, the idea of spiritual disciplines, 
And, and one of the spiritual disciplines within Christianity is meditation, where you, 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 you have that repetition, okay? And um, there is something about that discipline, that spiritual discipline of repeated meditation on something that is extremely powerful psychologically and spiritually. So we're going to look at that a little bit more. But um, So uh, traditionally, the Shemona Esrei was ascribed to the great assembly in the time of Ezra at the end of the biblical period. When was that? That's when we lost the temple, right? And the Jews got carted off to Babylon. And the only way they knew of worshiping God was what? In the temple, mm -hmm. presenting sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Now what the heck do we do, right? And so Ezra, as head of the scribes, you know, brought together the, the, the scribes and elders and so forth at the time, which was called the Great Assembly, and, and developed many of the elements of the liturgy as it is known today. So this is more than 2,000 years old. I mean, that's what blows my mind. I mean, the privilege of being able to pray this on a Saturday morning, it's more, it's more than 2,000 years old. Okay? And by the way, and the, and the reason I'm going through this material somewhat is because you'll see, you'll see the revel, relevance when we then try to understand Yeshua's words when he's talking about prayer. Because if you don't understand this, you can't understand that. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So it was only near the end of the second temple period that the 18 prayers of the weekday Amidah became standardized. And even at that time, the precise wording and order was not yet fixed and varied from locale to locale according to which rabbi was being followed in cases. So what we know is the Amidah that everybody has written in their book, you know, pretty much the same. Did they have books? Did they have scrolls? No, everything was memorized, all right? And at that time, what was important was more like the introduction, the ending, the, the 18 blessings, which are now 19, but that, that it's, so what people memorized was the structure, was the outline that you needed to make sure to, to, you know, thank God for the temple and ask for this and blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that was what was solidified at the time of Ezra. And it wasn't until after the time of Yeshua that it was kind of standardized more. And as we'll see, that soon after the destruction of the temple in the Jerusalem, a formal version of the Amidah was adopted at a rabbinical council in Yavne under Gamaliel II. However, the precise wording was still left open. The order, general ideas, opening and closing lines were fixed. Most of the wording was left to the individual reader, and that's something important to understand about the Shemona Esrei. We pray it, how do we pray it? We pray it first silently. And then we pray it as community, if you do it the way it's traditionally done. Okay? Why? We're going to see that in a minute. But what it does is it allows us to do both aspects of prayer, both, both the private individual devotion, where we can add our own words in. We can pray our own prayer if we want to as we stand before God within the community. And then we pray it again as a community. And we'll see why that's so important that we say it in unison as a community, okay? Um, but what I want you to notice here, that it always was part of the Amidah, that, that you could put in your own words, you could say things in your own words. And different groups had different customs about how they prayed it. And so, and I'm skipping ahead of myself a little bit, but so we think about the disciples come to Yeshua, and they say, teach us to pray. Uh, be, the, the way that John taught his disciples to pray. What do you think they're talking about? Did, did, do the disciples not know how to pray? Now, we just said that they've been doing the Samidah for like thousands of years before Yeshua. They, like, they don't get it? They don't know how to do it? Is that what they're talking about? Because that's what Christian interpreters of that verse thinks that it means. That they don't know how to pray, so teach us how to pray, because we don't know how to pray. Okay? Do they know how to pray? Of course they know how to pray. So in Luke, it says it's a little bit different than Matthew, and we're going to look at that. But in Luke, the disciples come to him and say, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. So if you know that the wording is slightly different depending on where you are and who you follow, and it had to be memorized, it wasn't written down, you didn't all have a book. 
what are they? What do you think they're saying? Mm. What do you think they're saying? Mm. Pardon? The Amidah. Well, but they all knew the Amidah, right? But there was variations, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. John taught his disciples to pray it a certain way. And they're coming to Yeshua and saying, well, we're following you, so how do you want us to pray? Mm -hmm. Right? Not how to pray in general. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another clue. And this is some of the stuff I'm excited about, so I'm jumping ahead of my outline. But... <laughs> So another word for the Amidah. By the way, you guys know what Amidah means? Standing. Standing. Okay, because we stand while we say it. Why do we stand when we say it? This is part review from last, last week. They stood in the temple. They stood in the temple, right? And we talked last week about how Jews stand, pagans prostrate, right? right? Mm -hmm. Susie, why do we... Mm -hmm. Jews stand, pagans preferences. It's about reverence. reverence. Okay. And what we'll see is that the Shemoni Esrei in the part of the whole liturgy, if you actually do all of the liturgy, there's there's a build up to the Shemona Esrei that we're building up to coming into the courts of the king. And now we're standing in reverence before him. And that's why at the beginning of the, the Shemona Esrei, which means, by the way, 18, because there's 18 blessings only they added, a 19th after the temple was destroyed. So it's the Shimon Esrei, it's the Amidah, it's the 18 blessings that we stand, stand to say because we're in the presence of the king. And so if, I don't know if you ever noticed it in the Nisidur, it says it's traditional to take three steps back and then it's three, three, three steps forward. Why do we do that? Because we come into his presence. Right. Is that why Be they do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because we are acting out like a play. We are putting into our body to help us get into the presence of God. We are putting into our body an action. Remember, everything in Judaism, it's not about what you think. It's never about what you think. Faith, emunah, is trust as, 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 as expressed in obedience, which is an action. It's not a cognitive belief like the Greek for the Greeks. It's something you do. Okay? So Passover, we just came through Passover. What do we do at Passover? We're dipping, we're chopping, we're eating this, we're eating that, we're crying because of the maror, blah, 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 blah. We're doing things, right? So the beginning of the Amidah, we do something. We step three steps back. We step three steps forward. We, be we bend our knees and we bow. Because if this was the throne room and we're coming in to see the king, and we talked about reverence last time, what are you going to do before the king? You acknowledge his sovereignty. And at the beginning of the Amidah, that's what we're doing. We're acknowledging his sovereignty. We're coming into the presence of the king. So is it just like a stupid little custom? A silly little thing? Not at all. No, it can be an incredible way of getting your whole body. Like we dance in worship. We dance in Messianic Judaism. We dance. We get our whole body into worship. You have to understand the liturgy is a way of getting your whole body and soul into mm -hmm. worship. Right. But it's hidden in there yeah. if you don't understand what it is. Okay. And you take your time, too, before you, well, I do, before you take those three steps, you know, mm -hmm. you think about what you're, what you're doing, uh -huh. you know, and the words that you're going to say and what actually is going to take place. Uh-huh. You know, right? It's just not just you know, just some simple. Oh, the Jews, yada yada, do this. No, you're concentrating on this, and this is what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. You're going to take those three steps, mm -hmm. come into His presence. And what do we call that? Kavana. We had to do it with kavana, right? Reverence. And I identifying with it like it's really happening right now. So. So the disciples come to Yeshua in Luke 11 and say, teach us to pray. So one of the, um, one of the names for the Shemona Esrei is Shemona Esrei, which means 18, because there's 18 blessings. The other name for the Shemona Esrei is Amidah, the Amidah, because we're standing. There's another less well-known name for the Shemona Esrei in Judaism. It's called... Tefillah. What does tefillah mean? Prayer. prayer. Think of it as prayer with a capital P. It's the tefillah. It's the prayer. 
Ah. Ah. Oh, ah, ah, ah. ah. <laughs> so the disciples say, teach us to pray? Did they say, teach us to pray? Or how did, maybe they said, if I said, came to you and I said to you in English, um, te teach me how, how, how to say the prayer, and you didn't know what the prayer meant, what would you interpret me to say? I'm speaking English wrong, right? <laughs> if, you're, if you're a Gentile and you don't know what tefillah, with the capital T, is, and the Hebrew says, teach us to pray, you have no context to put that request in. One of the, um, one of the interpretations of the Lord's Prayer, which follows, is that that the disciples were coming to him and saying, how do you want us to pray the prayer? Tefillah. How do you want us to do tefillah? How do, we, how do you want us to do tefillah? Not prayer with a small p, but prayer with a capital P. Because everybody did this prayer. But there was variations. So... Uh, it's very interesting when you look at the elements of that prayer, um, it's very similar to in the Talmud where there, there's a, a listing of all the different prayers that all the different rabbis taught their disciples to say at the end of the Amidah. So I just want to share, that. again, I, I'm doing this a little bit out of order, but I wanted, this was so exciting to me last time, I want to make sure you got this right. I'm going to just read you something, you don't have this, so... So um, Aaron Eby at First Fruits of Science says this. So there's in Berachot, which is a part of the Talmud, there's two pages. There's a list of personal petitions that were offered by the various sages after they completed the Amidah. The Jewish traditions that as a person prays each of the prayers leading up to the Amidah, he or she draws closer and closer to the throne room of God, so to speak. And when you reach the tef tefillah, you stand, as it were, in the heavenly holy of holies. Of course, it also brings to mind the scripture, you know, that we can boldly approach the throne of God, that, the, that, that there no longer is any veil, that we can go into his presence through Yeshua. Okay. So he goes on to write, one should not take such a situation for granted. Here you are, like Queen Esther, with the royal scepter extended. It is the perfect time to make your most heartfelt desires known to God. So these sages composed beautiful supplications that they would pray privately along with the, tef the tefillah. But if these were private prayers, how do we know what, what was said? Because they taught their prayers to their disciples, who would likewise offer them when they said the prayer. So he says, to me it is clear that this is what the master meant when he said, when you pray, that is, when you say the tefillah, say this. Just as the Amidah is prayed three times a day, so the concluding prayer is offered each time three times a day. And Aaron E.B. says that we actually have a document called the Dadache, which is the early, one of the earliest documents of the early, early believers. And in the Dadache is the Lord's Prayer. And it was prayed three times a day. So you know it was included as part of the liturgy. The question is, where was it? And so Aaron is saying, uh, just as the Amidah is prayed three times a day, so the concluding prayer is offered each time, and this would account for its usage in the Dadake. Today, the concluding prayer that was chosen as the standard conclusion for the Amidah is not known as Elohei Netzor. That's the part at the very end that starts, my God, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking deceitfully. Well, this is the first time I learned this last night. At, I, I think this was 2.30 a.m. I'm not sure. Um, it is attributed in the Gemara to Mar, son of Rabina. So in other words, it's one of those prayers that the rabbis taught their disciples to pray at the end of the tefillah, right? And so Aaron says, well, personally, I don't actually pray that prayer, at least not very often, not because I have any problem with it, because, in fact, I think it's beautiful, but I'm not a disciple of Mar. I'm a disciple of Yeshua. And so I pray the prayer that he taught me, Avino Sheba Shamayim Yet Shimcha. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So if you look in our Siddur, where did Bob put the Lord's Prayer? 
right after the Yummy Dog guys. <laughs> okay. My I didn't actually call him up and ask him about this, but I'm pretty sure he probably knows all about this. But for me it was exciting because it was the first time I read it last night. But it is actually in your Sudor right after um, the Shemona Esrei. So one of the things you might experiment with is praying the Lord's Prayer after you pray the Shemona Esrei. Because maybe that's in fact what Yeshua meant when he said, when you pray, say this. Okay. So we'll go on to some other issues about um, what Yeshua said about prayer in, in a bit. But any questions or comments so far about what I'm sharing? Thoughts? Yeah. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. It's like all of a sudden, it's like, well, what do we do? I always thought, like, well, what do we do with the Lord's Prayer? Because, you know, because there's, we're going to see in a minute, there's like controversy. It's always been a controversy within Christianity. Well, he just said not to do vain repetitions, so he can't possibly mean for us to do it exactly what he said. What do you think? Do you think we're supposed to pray it exactly what he said? Yeah. Because that was the Jewish practice of the day. The masters taught the disciples when you finished the tefillah, pray this. Diane. I think that's uh, I, sometimes there's still so much grief in us. Mm -hmm. Because the thing is, that's the way we were taught. We were raised. So, yeah. yeah, so that's the perspective we come from. Right. So when you give it a Hebraic twist, it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. It's all Hebrew. It's, all, it's still all Jewish. Yeah. So I gave you a copy of the Lord's Prayer, transliterated, in Hebrew. Because what would they have prayed in? Hebrew. Not Aramaic. No. There's another whole te teaching uh, I could go into, but the rabbis would say you never prayed in Aramaic. And it's, it, it's kind of based on this kind of funny thing, but their, their idea was that when we pray individually, because we are praying individually, that we need kind of like a mediator between us and God, right? But when we pray communally, we don't, and I'll talk about why in a minute. But, and, and they say, well, the angels don't speak Aramaic, so don't bother praying in Aramaic because they don't know what the heck you're saying. <laughs> That's basically <laughs> why you will never hear an observant Jewish person praying in Aramaic, even though a lot of the commentaries were written in Aramaic and so forth and so on. So there's this whole thing about like what language did Yeshua speak? Well, he probably spoke Aramaic when he was talking like I'm talking, but I doubt very much that he prayed in Aramaic. Um, Trina, mm -hmm. um, uh, I heard somewhere as a, a commentator was saying that you know the Lord's Prayer would be better... Uh, said to say it's the Talmudim's prayer. The disciples' prayer, yes. The disciples' prayer, because it starts off, Our Father, Correct. who art in heaven. Correct. And I really like that, because then it's like, um, for when we pray, you know, it's not worth saying it. Yes, yes. yes. This version oh, of very good. <laughs> There's another version I, I found, uh -huh. but it doesn't have the uh, transliteration of the Hebrew, so I gave you the one that has a transliteration of the Hebrew. But this is the di disciples' prayer in Hebrew. Yeah. And just listen to how it sa sounds. Beautiful. Okay, I just let's let's just mm -hmm. for a moment just take a little mm -hmm. pause. Avino shabashmaim yitkadeshem cha tava tavo malchiteka ya ase retsamecha ba aretz kasher na asava shemaim ten lanu hayom lachem chuchenu usalech lanu et ashmatenu. Ka asher salachim anaknu la asher ashamu lanu. Ve'al tevenu lede masa ki im hatzilenu minhara ki lecha ha mamlecha ve hagavura ve hatiferet. Le olamai olamim ome. Beautiful. Isn't that cool? Beautiful. One just little, since we're on the, on the Lord's Prayer, so I don't have to come back to it later. There is a controversy about how we translate it into English. I learned it a certain way in the Anglican Church. I can't get it out of my head. Because, of course, it's one of the rote prayers that you do learn um, in a liturgical congregation. And so when, and I actually, this particular format from Hebrews for Christians retains the typical... Um, translation, lead us not a temptation. A Jewish uh, person would have a really hard time yeah. with that. Because does God lead us into temptation? No, he can't. 
Okay. So what does the Hebrew actually say? Okay. It says, uh, I'm going to find it here. Ve'al tivenu lide masa, okay, means do not lead us into the hands of masa. What is masa? It's not quite temptation. It's translated temptation. But masa is, um, I can bring it up here. Hold on a second. Masa is more, it's a state of... Um, desolation, it's a state from which we would be tempted to sin. It's a, a let me, let me see if I can find it. Um, evil inclination. No, that's in the next line, but you're, you're going there. Um, like a situation that would cause us to maybe Yes, Te the things. word is testing. Mm -hmm. So it's a testing, it's a place of testing, it's a situation of testing. So do not lead us into te testing. He led many, many of the patriarchs into, te he tested them. So it wouldn't be temptation, it would be testing? Yes, do not le lead us, lead, do not lead us to, into the hands of testing would be a better translation. Um, I apologize, I... There is a better, um, and it uses the word lead, not lead. Mm -hmm. It's actually prod. It's poke. It's prod. Yeah, do not prod us into testing. Um, into the hands of testing. Mm -hmm into the hands of Masa. Yeah. It's a specific Hebrew idiom is the point that I'm saying. Yes. It's, not the word, it's not the English word temptation. It's a Hebrew idiom, the hands of Masa. Um, I apologize. I wanted to... I'm sorry. I have six sources on my screen, and I forgot to annotate which one was the one that I wanted to read this, that quote from. Um, Okay. Well, I'll look it. I'll look it up for you. But but the idea is, it's this place of despair, of desolation, this situation of testing, this from which we might be tempted to be evil. But he's not leading us into temptation. Does that make sense? It's yeah, a Hebrew yeah. idiom, and I, and I will I will add it to the handout because I, I did not put it in the handout. I will add it to the handout so that you have it. Okay. We need I, to understand he's not leading us to sin. Exactly. That's, that's the thing. I exactly. remember reading something too on it, but I can't recall. It's basically yeah. keep us from being tested. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, have it have it transpire that we don't have to get to the point of having to right. be tested. Yeah. Right. Yes. God cannot. Uh, Yes, to test us with more than we can bear. Yes, oh, that is, it. thank you very much. That is the point. It's in James? In James, yeah. If you could find it for us, that would be great. And then in the next line it says, but deliver us from evil. Okay, it's ki'im haksileno min hara. So it's, that's that word hara, evil. And in, in a sense, it's like when we're in that, that place of testing that we have to be wary of our yetzer hara, that, that old old us, right, mm -hmm. that will lead us into the wrong choice. And um, I found this. I, thank you. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Uh, verse 13. Verse 13. 14. It says, Let no man say, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God will not be tempted with evil, Neither tempted he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, and that was that is the point that the rabbis would have said to our English translation. But we've all memorized it. Lead us not into temptation, right? Mm -hmm. Theologically and and actually linguistically inaccurate. So um, hopefully that gives you 
a better appreciation for this very Jewish prayer. It's a very, very Jewish prayer. And there's, if you go online, actually look it up, and I, I can, I can uh, include some references because I didn't have time to go into all the parallels. You could spend a whole hour on it. But there's like parts of it that are very similar to other Jewish prayers. <coughs> Okay. And you know, you know that the doxology was added later, right? For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. on man. It's taken out of uh, Chronicles, I think. <laughs> you didn't know that, okay? You knew that. No. <laughs> oh. Okay. It's so awesome. Kiss, kiss. I'm so glad it's recorded. Yeah, it is recorded. They're all recorded, and I and I just have to get them up there. Uh, all right. <laughs> So anyway, so yeah, the doxology which we add for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory um, was added in later manuscripts. It's not in the original manuscripts. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, added. Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, there's nothing. Yeah, but terrible about it but it wasn't in the, it's not in the earliest manuscripts so the idea is that probably somebody added it because they put it in liturgy you know they put it in the church liturgy and so they may have done a little bit of reinventing of history. when we were in the catholic church mm -hmm. that last part for them is the king we didn't learn it i know i know you didn't if that didn't come we learned that way later yes because in the catholic church they don't teach it because their manuscripts are earlier. Ah, ah, it's a Protestant thing. Yeah, and the Catholic Church doesn't do doesn't include it for that reason. And if you think about it, the Catholic Church is closer in time, right, to the beginnings of the believing community, right? Yeah. So anyway, just a little bit about. Okay, so. So is liturgy starting to get a little more exciting? Mm -hmm. A little bit more yeah, meaningful? Yes, meaningful. Like why we do it? Why we do it? Yes. Okay, oh, good. That's the idea. 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 Right. <laughs> so, uh, so just a little, little. So in the structure um, of the Amida, uh, I already talked about we're coming into the throne room of God. One rabbi said that um, the structure also kind of reflects that um, it's, it's uh, Rabbi Hanina said, in the first blessings, one resembles a servant who praises his master. In the middle ones, one resembles a servant requesting some gift from his master. And in the last ones, one resembles a servant who has received his gift and takes his leave. Now, if I refer to the 18 blessings and you're used to play, praying the Amidah every Saturday, you're not going to know what I'm talking about. Does anybody know why? If I talk about 18 blessings in the Shemona Esrei, and you and you think about what we typically do on sh on Saturday morning on Shabbat, mm -hmm. you might know what not what I'm talking about. You might go, "There's not 18 blessings. Why? There isn't, by the way, on Shabbat. We don't play pray all 18 blessings on Shabbat. Why? Because some of them are only reserved for feast days, right? Um. Yes. Well, there. Because on any other day, at any other time, you do do the 18 blessings. So yes, they're reserved for other days, but why not Shabbat? Could it, could it be the, the part that says requesting some gift from his master? Yes, exactly. So, so in Judaism, because Shabbat is all about celebrating a day as if we had already received everything that we had needed. Shabbat is about celebrating... Adan Alam, right? It is, it is the, the uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, 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 I always go with that stuff. Uh, Haba, Allah, Allah, uh, the, the world to come. I'm, I'm, it's escaping me, the Hebrew. Alam Haba. Thank you, Alam Haba. Um, uh, Adan Alam means master of the universe, right? <laughs> I'm saying, no, the universe to come. So Shabbat is all about having one day in the week that we live as if we're already there. So if we're already there, there's nothing to ask for. We don't make supplication on the part of ourselves 
on Shabbat. Therefore, when we do the Shemona Esrei, if you'll notice, there's all these gray pages that we flip over. Those are the 18 blessings. Some of the 18 blessings. Those are the ones we're skipping over, right? So which daily. is why, which is why, which which those of us like Nancy who pray it daily know that they are there every single day. Okay. okay. On the Siddur, we're talking about that on Shabbat we skip over page 115 through 119. What are the things that we're praying for? We're asking for in the Shemona Esrei, not on Shabbat. Insight, repentance, forgiveness. We're making all those requests. Redemption, health and healing, year of prosperity, in gathering of the excess, restoration of justice against the heretics, the righteous, rebuilding Jerusalem, the Davidic reign, acceptance of our prayer. All of those things we skip over because they're all petitions. So on Shabbat, we come in, we praise the king, we thank him, we leave. Because we already got it all. Yes. But that also means that if you don't play the, pray the Shema Esrei on any other day, <laughs> you're not playing 18 blessings. I don't. I was used to be. Why do they call it 18 blessings? I don't see 18 blessings. Where do they go? <laughs> They're right there. They're between pages 115 and 119. But we pray it on a different day. Now they told us like um, what the reason was that we skip over them. They just said don't read the ones in the box. Oh. Right. So we appreciate this class. <laughs> <laughs> why have we been doing this every Shabbat for the last three years? We don't know why we did it. I have a question. Yes, Nancy. Okay. Um, the eight, the nineteenth prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't do that one during the week because I heard a rabbi say that as a messianic we should pray that one. The nineteenth against heretics. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you feel? How do I feel about, about the one against that? heretics? Uh huh. During the week. Uh -huh. I just omit it, I, you know, because yeah. of the, with the rabbi, and I was like, well, you could have a point, and, and I don't understand it, but... Yeah, that's a good question. So the, the 19th blessing is the one on page 117 against heretics, and yes. this translation is, and for slanderers let there be no hope, and or heretics really, mm -hmm. and may all wickedness <coughs> perish in an instant, and may all your enemies be cut down sp speedily. And may you speedily upright smash, cast down, and humble the wanton sinners speedily in our days. Blessed are you, O Lord, who breaks enemies and humbles wanton sinners. It's pretty harsh. Yeah. It was added after the destruction of the temple. Can you imagine why? The destruction of the temple. They, uh, mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So if you think about the context of the persecution of Jews by the heretics, see, there is one opinion that says it was added because the heretics were the Christians, right? Mm -hmm. the, yes. The heretics are the believers. And so if we pray this, we are praying against ourselves. I think that's where the opinion mm -hmm. comes, right? Uh, Correct. Yes. Hence, Messianic believers shouldn't pray that because you're basically bringing curses on yourself. Because... But well, but in the original intention of those who, of, of of the Jewish sages who had added the nineteenth blessing, they really were saying, "Cut down our enemies." But we also pray that at Passover, we don't we don't hold back from praying that at Passover true. to cut down the enemies of God. So when I pray this, okay, no, I pray it with the kavanah, the understanding that I'm talking about those who are against God, of which, frankly. In the world, people who are intentionally working against God's purposes, like there are. Satan, there are. Yes. But they're the minority. Right. They're not your neighbor who doesn't know what the heck's going on. Uh -huh. So some people would say, like, we're, we're, we're condemning anybody who doesn't believe the way we do or condemning anybody who's not Jewish. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's often viewed that way. I don't pray it that way. No. Okay. I don't see it that way. So I don't have any problems with saying the words like at Shabbat or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problems with saying the words. Because my kavanah, my understanding is I'm not heaping curses on my head. No. I'm praying against the enemies of God, which we are called to do, right. to come the, against the enemies of God. Right. I, the rabbi was like, his view was that um, as a messianic, 
you know, we do have mercy and, and hope for all peoples, and you know. Uh, well, I do, respect, and we do. We I do, do have mercy yes. and hope for all, yes. all peoples. Yes, but but so, um, but we're also called not to have anything to do with. To be set apart, also. To be set apart and not right. to have anything to do with people who are active enemies of God. Right. And I know some. <laughs> so. <laughs> no, seriously, I do. I know. So, so what you see in the Shemona Esrei on Shabbat is that the, the that what remains is they replaced a lot of those eighteen blessings with, um, you know, uh, the holiness of the day portion about how, uh, you know, thanking God for his gift of Shabbat, thanking God for his Torah, thanking God for the prophets, and so forth and so on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's also, by the way, that whole principle of, of uh, not asking for petitions for ourselves when we do the um, Misha Barak, we're asking on behalf of others. Mm -hmm. We don't ask on behalf of ourselves, which is why I always feel a little uncomfortable when it says, well, how are you doing? I'm like, yeah, but I... Yes, I know. Time. Very well, and I feel loved when somebody asks me that question. But um, anyway, so, uh, and by the way, the, we haven't talked about the service as a whole yet, and we'll probably won't get on to talking about that till next time, but um, typically the Mishavarak is done at the time that the Torah is taken out of the Ark. So uh, if you think about the you think about the service as a whole. So you have all the stuff leading up to the Shemona Esrei, right? And then you make the transition into the Torah, and then that takes you even to another level. That gets you prepared for taking the Torah out of the Ark, and that represents like the gates of heaven are open, mm -hmm. which is why typically, traditionally, we do the Mishaberic after the Torah portion, before the Haftar portion, because because it's, it's, it's done right after the... Um, uh, you know, when you lift the Torah up and you show everybody, this is the Torah. Okay. You guys realize how awesome that is, right? Do you have a Torah scroll here? We, we do. Yes. Okay. But you do realize that, that for a people whose temple was destroyed and they were sold off into slavery, and not only did they not have the temple, but they didn't have the Torah scrolls. And then they got back to the land, and in the ruins of the temple... They find the scrolls hmm. and imagine the priest holding up the scroll going, this is the word of the Lord to Moshe. It's right here. It's on the scroll. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking about when I'm in service and they hold that up. It's like, oh my gosh, Moshe really said that. There it is. It's the proof. It's physical. I can see it. I can touch it. It's there. And, and the joy of the people of like, oh my gosh, we found it. There is so much, guys, there is so much in the service. Yes. If you are, have in mind the context, there's so much. But anyway, so we do the Misha Barak, and we offer those petitions on behalf of others. When the Torah, the, the, the understand, Sid's always concerned that newcomers misinterpret that we are worshiping the Torah, Torah like it's an idol, but it is a symbol of the king, okay? It is a symbol of God's reality. It's evidence of his love for us, that we are, we are reverencing him. We're not bowing to the, to the piece of paper. Right. We're bowing to the king who wrote the piece of paper. Right? That's right? And we're rejoicing that he sent us a note. Oh, by the way, <laughs> just thought I'd let you know. <laughs> and, and so we, we say the Misha when the, when the gate of heaven is open and the Torah is open on the bima. Mm -hmm. Because we have physical evidence of God's love for us and his accessibility. And we have come into the throne room and not, we're not hanging out at the, at the, at the, at the first court. We're right up there at the throne of God when we take the Torah out of the ark. Does that make sense? Absolutely. At least that's the way I think yeah, about yeah, absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's the way I think about it. So um, anyway, you know, mm -hmm. I don't think as Gentiles we can ever fully appreciate what the Torah means. When you think about the Holocaust and that people gave their lives to 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 
preserve those Torah schools because for the Jewish people, when they stopped listening to Torah, they stopped following Torah, they lost everything. They lost their land, their temple, their, their, their family members. They became slaves. They were carted off to... Can you even imagine that somebody just picks you up out of your house and takes you someplace else? The Jews had to do that during the Holocaust too. The Nazis came and took them out of their house and took them off. Yes. We have no idea what those Torah scrolls represent in terms of God's faithfulness to his people right. and, and, and his commandments because he said, if you follow in this way, you will have life. Well, if I don't know what you said, how the heck can I do what you said mm -hmm. if I don't know it? Yes. So, so they, took, they took the Torah scrolls out of the synagogues and they burned them. And it was the discretion of the temple all over again, guys, all over again. There's this wonderful video that brought it home to me. And it was, believe it or not, it was at a, a, um, a session of the Jewish Genealogy Society. And um, they had this uh, gentleman that had gone as part of his doctoral dissertation to Europe to research uh, Yiddish melodies, music melodies. And he was trying to get with the survivors of the Holocaust because they had the melodies in their head. They weren't written down anymore. And he was trying, going out and trying to find these old people in the villages, you know, and trying to capture. And he would videotape them singing the melodies. And in the process, he came across this little village, I don't know, some Euro middle European country, where that had been decimated by the Holocaust and there was this little tiny room in, in a building and there was like nothing in it and the, the walls are like practically coming down and they, they didn't have a Torah. They barely had a minion left in the village. And he said to them, I'll get you a Torah. Wow. And he went back to America wow. and he raised the money and he bought the Torah. And you have no idea the joy of the people. Mm -hmm. They met the train at the train station. There's no cars in the village. It's not yes. that big. They followed the Torah rejoicing to the synagogue because they had their Torah back. Absolutely. That's what Simcha Simcha Torah, Torah is about. That's why we follow the Torah and we rejoice. Right. Because God has not left us and we have this physical expression Absolutely. of his love and what he said to us. And yes. we haven't, do you guys understand? I'm sorry, I'm, I do. really we, must be we, we hormonal today, but do you guys realize <laughs> we, at ESVT that you have a Torah? We have a Torah. We need to take it from every gesture. That's right, yes. It is such a gift of yes. God to us. Yes. It is, you, you, you don't understand, there's Jews in Europe who would give their lives to have that Torah, that did give those lives, their lives yes. to have a Torah. Right. The Torah. Mm -hmm. They gave their lives for it. Mm -hmm. That was the best thing that had ever happened to them in their village. Right. For them, God came back to them, and they could study it and see it. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, in biblical times, they didn't have books. Right. right. I'm sorry. No. I'm done preaching. No. <laughs> <laughs> you remind me of the scripture. Oh. Because... Yeah, you know, I've told my kids, you know, the Torah is Messiah. Mm -hmm. And when I, we've seen videos from Israel, done Israel, of the Jews praising the Lord who know Messiah. And, I'm, and it looks like Christians, you know, rejoice praising. Mm -hmm. worship. They're so excited. The verse, and I, so I know it's in Corinthians, it says, if, and I'm paraphrasing because I, I don't know how to memorize it, but if the, if the partial blindness of the Jews have brought us salvation, mm -hmm. what will be the salvation? What will it mean when the Jewish when they people come to salvation? And when they recognize Messiah. Messiah, which yes. to me, as you're talking about Torah, he is the Torah. He is the Torah. So that's how yes. you can relate to the joy of what you're saying. Yes. The joy that I felt in coming to know Messiah might lose my salvation. He was my son, redemption. He, was, mm -hmm. he atoned for me, you know. I, I rejoiced in that, and there was no other way. I, I, I prayed, Lord, how do I know uh, that I am going to heaven? And when the Lord answered that question through Messiah, mm -hmm. I, I rejoiced. Mm -hmm. So as you're talking, I can see that how you're saying that the same excitement for a church person rejoicing mm -hmm. over the same person I'm rejoicing only. You know, they, they don't know. They're seeing him in the word form. In the word form. He was the word, right? I can, I can see the I can 
relate now. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But I, I do rejoice in the Torah because there's times we we in other places where we. Uh huh. Oh, yes. I know. And, and you do. You. It's emotional. You, this is the, the word that God gave us. Right. I, I know what you're saying. And so when John says. In the beginning was the Word, mm -hmm. yeah. and the Word was with God, and we know that Yeshua was called HaTorah, uh -huh. and we understand how the Jewish people felt about finding those scrolls in Nehemiah's time. Don't quote me on that. But when they came back from Babylon, right? Oh my gosh. All of a sudden, boom, you're right. Yeshua, the Torah. It is God's gift to us. He shows us the way. He is the way. It is the way. It's so... Well, you know, I went one step so further. I had the opportunity. We, we were dancing. You know, it was the secret tour. We were dancing, and the tour was passed to me. Mm -hmm. I started crying. I'm mm -hmm. a woman. And, mm -hmm. and are the dots circles? Mm -hmm. Right. No. So it was, I rejoiced. I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm putting the tour. Mm -hmm. As you know. Everybody followed. Mm -hmm. That was an experience too. But I, you, I don't even feel something. I guess because I am, I, Messiah means so much to me. Mm -hmm. So here I'm holding. Yes. Mm -hmm. The first portion that was given. Right. Anyway. So I relate. Yes. <laughs> you know, okay. So, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't get much past my page four. Oh well. Um, so maybe we'll get into June as well as May. But. I don't want to prepare anything more. But there's a very interesting discussion coming up next time when we're going to talk about the gender of prayer and the language of prayer. Should we pray? Is it important to pray in Hebrew? Um, that whole thing you were talking about, that in, in Orthodox Judaism, you know, the, the woman doesn't hold the scroll. You know, what is our role as women in prayer? And within the context, you know, how is it seen in Judaism? What's, what, what is it now? There's some really kind of, Pretty cool things. And we were talking about it at lunchtime, about the role of woman as the crown of creation and how Judaism sees the woman as so spiritual. But basically, you know, women are seen as you don't have to do the liturgy. You don't have to do ceremonial or ritual prayer or communal prayer because basically, you know, we already got it together. <laughs> we're already at this other spiritual <laughs> level. And guys need the liturgy. Guys need the communal prayer to kind of get them to our level but it's an interesting idea, so we'll debate it a little bit. You know what? That kind of gives me an idea. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get my, my kids up for Shabbat because we stay up late because we always stay up late. Anyway, just send them all the men ahead. That's so awesome. Just send them ahead and while we're all finished and getting ready, let me get back. Okay, there you go. You <laughs> left us a practical <laughs> idea. Well, in fact, in fact, women did not go to synagogue for prayer for most of Jewish history. They did not. They didn't go. They didn't go. Or they, if they did, it was the older ones who didn't have to. They were going to get into it. And the whole idea of the Megitza and the women's gallery and what was that all about and yada, yada, yada. It's kind of it's just really kind of interesting. Anyway. There was a so. young Hasidic Jew who shared that with this young man. Mm -hmm. said, all the men, all the men go. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and I was like, well, what about the women? But see, now that explains it. What you're saying, oh, oh there's so it. much yeah, more. That, did you know that there's a whole... There's a whole, you know, we have the Siddur, right? Do you know that there's a whole centuries and thousands of years of women's prayers wow. called Takinah, so, Takinas or Takinot, that were written by women, for women? Wow. Didn't know that, huh? Mm. We'll talk some more about that next time. Probably get those <laughs> <laughs> Fairfax.